So Michael, thanks for joining me today. Um, I've been wanting to hunt you down for a long time because when I started this project, I thought, you know, you're somebody out there who has supported women and women's causes for a long time. And I'm curious as to why that was important to you and why you have a passion around it. Well, you know what, there, there's a number of reasons. I mean, I think when women first started, uh, for certain, I, I think I just recognized uh, a need, and it, it's it's interesting to think that uh, in those of us with privilege um, tend not to recognize it. So it's easy for for um, men, in particular, to sort of sit back and say, "Well, is there really a problem?" Mm -hmm. um, because the problem doesn't affect us. Yeah. Uh, so when I started seeing the groundswell um, from Wimmy. Um, you know, that was when I sort of first reached out to Hallie and said, how can I help? Um, it's always been something that, uh, that I've believed to be important. I've always um, believed in equality and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it just kind of happened organically a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I was a, a little bit surprised at the, uh, the pace of the, the movement within our industry. Mm -hmm. It just made it that much more apparent for the need uh, for something like that. Uh, and I started paying a little bit more attention and yeah, like I said, I reached out to Hallie um, back in the day and Suzanne and said, you know, how do I get involved and, and how can I help? Mm -hmm. um, I'm always a big fan of people taking action and making beautiful shit happen. I know. And, uh, <laughs> uh, anywhere I can support that, I'm all over it. So how were you able to recognize privilege? Because it's a really interesting comment you just made and because it doesn't really affect men, men aren't don't realize that they have that so how were you able to realize that you had that and how maybe you know women didn't and how it impacts us well again i i think just sort of by observation um i think that's sort of the biggest the first step is to have that open mind and actually be open to having a look around you and seeing what's going on mm -hmm. uh, and and losing some of that sort of myopic focus on you know it's just doesn't exist. Um, you know, there's all kinds of myths around gender equality, and it's easy to sort of bury your head in the sand. So I think the, the first thing for me, and I, I've always been a guy that's like to challenge my beliefs mm -hmm. um, in order to try and improve. I mean, if all we do is is sort of sit in an echo chamber and chamber and tell each other how great we are and uh, nobody ever challenges themselves. We don't grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, absolutely. so I think that's you know the first step is just being open to the concept that hey, wait a minute, maybe there is some difference here, uh, and then trying to look at it objectively. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I think that was really the key is just putting some challenges. You know, I'm a, a big fan of. Um, I talk about it often. You know, read something that challenges your beliefs, not yeah. reinforces them. Yeah. Because again, <laughs> it, it's easy. It, it's easy to, to find stuff that supports your beliefs really or your belief. opinions. Um, but if you really want to deepen those beliefs, then look for something that challenges them. And, you know, either your opinion gets swayed mm -hmm. uh, or it reinforces your beliefs. Either yeah. way, I think you win. Absolutely. So one of the things I did want to talk to you about is social injustice, because I've been doing these interviews with women and their experiences with social injustice and a little bit around the Me Too stuff and all of that. And I think it would be nice to have a man's perspective as well, because one of the things that I found really hard when all that sort of broke out last fall was so there was a number of women obviously posting hashtag me too on their Facebook status and I wasn't one of them not because I couldn't have but I just didn't want to identify as a victim that's how I felt about right. it and the other piece of me is you know I've had a lot of support in my life and, and in my career actually um, by some really amazing men and I'm the mother of two boys right. so I thought wow, like where are all the good men speaking out on this, right? And, and there wasn't because I think they all felt like, oh my God, I'm a man, I'm a perpetrator, even though I'm not a perpetrator. And there wasn't like this safe environment to actually speak to about any of that stuff. So I, I thought, you know what, I really want to create a safe place where good men can actually speak to social injustice. How do we change that? Because I think it's really the good men that are going to help the other men yes. level up and become better human beings, especially in their interac interactions and, and respect level towards women. Yeah, you know what, that's a great point. And, and, and I don't think it, it's even so much about helping women. It's about helping men. 
<laughs> um, because you know, and I, and I talk about it a lot. The 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 perils that that men run into um, when we sort of try and fall into that hyper masculine stereotype. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. I mean, with with things like the Me Too, it's it's easy for us to sort of say, "Oh shit, what do what do I do? I don't know what to say. Um, I'm yeah. just going to bury my head in the sand because I don't know if I say something, I might do it wrong." Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's about having the courage to to speak up um, and and call out those men that aren't so good. Because I mean, let's face it. There's there this is this is what blows my fucking mind. There is more of us yes. than there are of them yes yet I agree. those are the ones that get all the attention um because they do all the damage because they do all the damage yeah. and and yeah i mean again that's where the the um the attention goes that's where sort of the vocal minority uh so i i feel like you know we as as good men need to step up and start making some noise and and not necessarily about i mean certainly yes how we support women um, empowerment, so to speak. But again, we get caught in these freaking buzzwords and, and yeah. they start losing meaning. And I worry about that a little bit. Um, so so I, I kind of feel like we should almost stop trying to empower women and just start trying to, maybe even if you call it empower men, just empower them to be good men and mm -hmm. teach them how to speak up, um, how to support the women in their lives. Um, how to respect the women in their lives. How to respect the women in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's and that's, that's huge um, because we've got, you know, deck centuries of culture that we haven't had that. Mm -hmm. uh, so changing that mindset and making that mental shift uh, and especially I think for, for men sort of in, in the older generation, mm -hmm. it's probably a little more challenging. Yeah, yeah. Um, Certainly, I think, you know, my feeling is, and I've spoken at a lot of universities and things like that, my feeling is the younger generation is starting to get it. I think so, too. Uh, and they're yeah. a little more receptive to the concept. Well, they're more evolved. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They're, every generation, hopefully, will get a little bit more evolved, right? But I think, you know, talking about these things and also how they impact women, uh, I, I, and just having that conversation to bring awareness to it, I think it's a really important um, thing to do but the millennials especially i've just some of the conversations i've had with them it's been very encouraging yeah no absolutely i uh i got to speak at um uh, university of alberta and the university of new brunswick um and i was so impressed with mm -hmm. the the team that put on the the tedx talk there um young folks that just again i think really sort of got it mm -hmm. uh, it was really 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 refreshing i was pretty excited it was cool in at uh, in new brunswick I, I literally sat with you know a future doctor a future lawyer a future accountant and a future dentist they were the ones that on the organizing committee wow. um, and it was quite a diverse group yeah. ethnically and and uh, gender wise mm -hmm. uh, so it was really neat to see it was just really neat to so see. tell me a little bit about your ted talk and why you chose that subject matter <laughs> <laughs> well i think you know why why I chose that subject matter, but uh, yeah, so back in, um, so my TED talk I did on what I call redefining badass, mm -hmm. and I talk a lot about the impact that emotion has on human behavior, and it, it's been a really interesting journey because I, I realized sort of early in my sales career that my customers bought on emotion justified by logic, and you know, we use that in the sales context um, to promote our product or service. Uh, and then later as a business leader, I realized that, you know, staff productivity was directly linked uh, to emotion and emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, as you know, um, in October of 2015, uh, my girlfriend Colleen was murdered by an ex-boyfriend uh, who subsequently took his own life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at the impact that emotion has on human behavior. Like I said, for me, it started in the business realm, but when you extend that to everyday life, um, you can see sort of the extreme end of the spectrum um, where this can happen. So, you know, Paul Jacob, the man that killed Colleen, was a man that made a decision based on emotion. Uh, he made a decision with very permanent consequences mm -hmm. uh, based on a very temporary emotion. So the talk was really about 
allowing men to feel. And I think that is a huge issue we run into these days. Uh, again, it's interesting when I, when I talk at some of the universities and the young men come up to me and you can just see men everywhere are, are literally dying for somebody to give them permission to feel. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at the suicide rates yeah. uh, in men and it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I read up about it. Like when girls try, they usually make it, but when guys try, they're pretty successful every single time. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's just, you know, we've got this sort of stereotypical, you know, what we believe it means to be a man and we've got to suck it up and we've got to suppress our emotions and we've got to remain stoic and it's just bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with that is our emotions are coming out one way or the other. Um, so to think that you can suppress them, avoid them, or ignore them is, is just wrong. It just yeah. can't happen. Um, and it's gonna come out in some way. And un unfortunately, you know, in this circumstance, it, it came out in anger and rage and uh, ended up in the death of, of two people. Um, so I think, that there's some real potential perils when, you know, again, from the time we're, we're in diapers as men, we're taught to suck it up and don't be a don't pussy cry. and don't yeah. cry. Yeah. And, you know, not, not that I think men should be running around bawling their eyes out all over the place because <laughs> that's sort of the flip side of it. And, you know, you, you get people that I, I think sort of take that hyper extreme and, um, you know, I'm not sure that that's the case, but really just having the courage to face your emotions and explore them mm -hmm. um, is important. And I don't think enough people, I mean, women included, I yeah. mean, there's a lot of that there too. But, you know, in, in my particular case, I'm speaking directly to the men. And like I said, the, the response I get after I give a talk like that is just, it's phenomenal. Is like it? the, yeah. the, the men that come up to me afterwards and, and you can see it in their eyes. Like they're yeah. literally, it's like, oh, okay, you know what, this is, this is all right. So this is, and even having the ability to label those emotions and what am I feeling, why am I feeling it, um, for my money, emotional intelligence is, is such uh, a big part of what makes people successful. So much more in my opinion yes, than, I totally than, agree. than IQ. I totally agree. It's EQ all the way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, abs I, yeah. So you literally took the biggest mother load of lemons and made some magical <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> that's yeah. what you did. Yeah, well, you know, I had a choice and, and that's the thing. We, we all have a choice. Um, I could have curled up into a little ball and, and sort of withered away when Colleen was killed. Um, but that's not what she want, would have wanted to happen. And, you know, I was fortunate. I had uh, a lot of really good people in my life that sort of surrounded me and, uh, and lifted me up and, and sort of carried me through. Um, and one in particular, a friend of mine, Eric uh, Yogi from Montreal, mm -hmm. sent me a copy of a letter by a fellow by the name of Ramdas um, that was a letter to Rachel. And he'd written a letter to the parents of a young woman that was brutally murdered. Um, and in that letter, like it was very short, I think it was maybe four paragraphs. That letter, I mean, I can honestly say changed my life. In, in that letter, there were sort of three big takeaways. Um, the first thing he said was, uh, who among us is strong enough to remain conscious through such teachings as you're receiving? Probably very few. And, and when I read that, I just, I realized that, you know, this was an opportunity I've been given. It's not an opportunity I would wish upon my worst enemy, mm -hmm. but it's an opportunity very few people will ever get to experience. Um, so who am I to fucking waste that, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, who am I to squander that? And I made a very deliberate decision to remain awake and stay conscious, conscious through this yes. and feel what I needed to feel. Uh, you know, the second thing he talked about was now is the time to let your grief find expression, no false strength. Um, and that one really hit home too, because you know, I, I was surrounded by a lot of well-meaning friends that would pat me on the back and tell me to be strong. And, you know, don't cry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't don't yeah. cry so much, but the, the whole be strong mm -hmm. thing I struggle with because I think we've, we've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the way we think about strong is wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to think that it's this suck it up and, and, and stay brave and, 
uh, put on your game face, your brave face. And I tell you what, when, when Colleen was murdered, I didn't want to stay strong. I wanted to curl up into a little ball and I wanted to cry like a fucking baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I did. One of my best friends, Jamie, she, that's her nickname for me now, is Mikey Baby. Because I, <laughs> I was telling her this story and uh, she was, uh, was kind of my rock when, when this happened. And uh, uh, she said, you know what? She said, just cry if you Aww. need to. You know, and and uh, like I said, so, so my nickname is, and that was, she calls me MB, Mikey Baby. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes it's just nice for someone to give you that permission too. Totally, absolutely, right? absolutely. So yeah, I, th I think you know when that that happened. Like I said, I had a choice, and it's been interesting to see because you know I get a lot of people that come up to me and they say you know, and they tell me about their struggles and their mm -hmm. stories, and they always qualify it with, "I know this doesn't compare to what you went through." But the beautiful thing is, we don't need to compare struggles. No, absolutely. You know, we all struggle. Um, but the beautiful thing is we don't have to struggle alone. Yeah. Like just having this conversation, yeah, yeah. having people like you and Suzanne in my life, um, you know, we don't have to go through any of this shit alone, whether it, whether it's something as massive as what I went through, um, or whether it's, you know, something that you lose a job, you lose a deal and you feel crappy, um, you know, there's varying degrees of this and it, but it's all the same thing. You know, grief is an interesting thing and it doesn't have to be the death of a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we grieve many things. Could be a, a you know, a relationship, a breakup. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, could be as, as small as a lost deal. Mm -hmm. um, but we need to recognize it as grief. Yeah, absolutely. If you feel like you're not being supported mm -hmm. and you do want to move, you know, from X to, to Y, yeah. um, you know, maybe there are people you need to cut out of your life. Oh, totally. Uh, <laughs> Social gardening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Social gardening. I yeah, like it. Yeah. I like it. But it's so true. And I think sometimes we feel guilty about that. And yeah. we, you know, well, I'm not being a true friend and I need to support this person in reverse. And, and to some extent that's true, but you've got to recognize the difference between supporting a friend and having a friend that's a fucking anchor. Yeah. The A in sparkle is for adversity and how we can, how we can accept adversity and use it as a platform to advance upon even bigger opportunities. And what's so beautiful about this is this is seriously one of the biggest like pieces of adversity you could go through, like the death of a loved one in such a traumatic, awful kind of way. And then you can actually turn around and take that and turn it into something beautiful to help other people. Yeah. Like there's always that silver lining, even though it might be hard to see it in that moment, there's always that silver lining in every cloud and a big rainbow that can pop out. Yes. If you choose to make that happen, if you choose to make beautiful shit happen. Yes, absolutely. Living is about giving, right? Yeah. I think when you really get that and do that, I think that's when magic happens. I think that's when life really opens up. Yeah. Well, f for me, I think the beginning of it was really moving from sort of head based to heart based mm -hmm. um, in my life and, and recognizing that there was a balance. You know, and it wasn't all about sort of making those logical decisions yeah. and starting to listen to my gut and my heart yeah. and starting to move in that direction more. And I, I think, you know, that's that's probably not a bad place to start mm -hmm. for many people. You know, you don't have to jump into the deep end. Yeah. Start swimming in the shallow end. Yeah. Um, but just start paying attention to your heart and your emotions and, and what you feel. Um, try and find words for them. Put labels on them. Like I said, that's one of the most challenging things is to recognize what it is we feel because we often just feel things we react yeah and on we go and then you know in hindsight we may see it but we may not we may just move through mm -hmm. so taking that pause and you know as you know i'm a big fan of yoga and meditation um so even just taking that sort of mini meditation and, and taking a moment to just yes Yes, yes. Taking a breath and say, okay, what is, what's going on right now? What's happening in my body? You know, somebody just cut me off in traffic. Somebody, so I, I use traffic a lot as practice because <laughs> right, it's, it's easy to get pissed off when that idiot in front of yeah. you cuts you off. Um, sure. So I start looking at, at that as practice. Okay, what am I feeling right now? I'm pissed off because that asshole just cut me off. Okay, so what do I do with that? And, you know, I can react, I can respond, I can flip him the bird. Well, maybe that just gives, makes him have a shitty day. It certainly doesn't help me have a better day. 
Um, or I could just relax and I can start making up my own story as to, you know what, maybe his wife's in the hospital, maybe, you know, yes, who knows, yes, who knows yes, what's yes. going on, right? Yeah. Um, so I think just recognizing that feeling uh, is the beginning and then sort of making that choice as to what to do with it. So once you can identify what it is, you can realize, you know, and, and sometimes maybe maybe acting on that emotion is the appropriate response, but that can be a decision, not just a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. He's talking about the L in sparkle, which is give more love to the world in everything you yes. think, act, speak, and do. And I've tried to consciously put this into practice too, because I'm, I'm a road rager to a certain, I get on the highway, I think I'm, you know, <laughs> a race car driver. Uh, but if you can just kind of put your compassionate hat on and be more loving and giving when those challenging things happen, yeah. you know, someone flips you the bird or whatever, this is like, oh, you know what? Only someone who's having a really bad day is doing that to right. someone else. So if you can sort of look at it like that and reframe it in your mind, then you can kind of throw love there and not let it upset you, which is really powerful. Yes. And it's, it's how, I, um, how I try to live. I'm not always perfect no, at well, it either, but I try to be conscious of it and make that choice as much as humanly possible. Yeah, well, I think that's important too, is recognizing that we're not going to be perfect, yeah. right? This is this is a practice. It's yeah. not it's not um, sort of an end game. It's we always continue to get better. And the goal isn't to be perfect. It's to be just a little bit better today than you were yesterday. So we've been talking about making beautiful shit happen, and uh, my hashtag is make beautiful shit happen. Uh, and where that came from, Colleen and I used to talk a lot about philosophy and. Uh, one of the things, one of my favorite conversations we ever had was on the subject of talent. And um, so I asked her, I said, you know, what's your talent? Mm -hmm. And she replied that, well, I make things beautiful. <laughs> and certainly as a, an artist, a photographer, a videographer, uh, a potter, a painter, she had an absolute knack for finding the beauty in everything. And uh, so she turned it around and she said, you know, what, what do you think your talent is? And I kind of hummed and hawed and I said, you know, I don't know, not to sort of take away from what I've done because by all standard measures I've been successful, but I'm not sure that there was any sort of one thing that I've been particularly gifted at. So I, I asked her, I said, well, what do you think my talent is? She said, oh, that's easy. You've got a much more useful talent. I said, oh, what's that? She said, well, you make shit happen. And I said, <laughs> oh, I kind of like that as a business guy. So there you had it. She made things beautiful, I made shit happen. Together, we were gonna make beautiful shit nice. happen. Nice. So I swore on October 2nd uh, that her story would not end there in her driveway and that I would continue to do my best mm -hmm. to make beautiful shit happen in her name. So wow. there you have it. Good for you. So are we ready for his unicorn uh, yoga pose here? <laughs> oh. <laughs> What is my unicorn yoga pose? I don't to know. Me? I don't know. I think, didn't Suzanne send you something? Or you? What was it like that? <laughs> it's the unicorn yoga pose. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Make beautiful shit happen. Make magic happen. Thank you, Mike. Love you.